So earlier this season, I took my nephew on a hike in the White Mountains. Ready to rock him. We did an epic hike of the Presidential Range, one that he completed with relative ease. So this time I said, let me introduce you to the Adirondacks. We'll do a legit backpacking trip, three days inside the Great Range. Now the whites are difficult hiking, and they certainly have the wow factor. But in my opinion, the Adirondacks just seem to hit a little harder. So I put together a route, and we are on our way. Now I already know that I'll be hurting, but let's see if I can make him flinch this time. Our hike would start off at the garden parking area. We'd put on our packs and begin our saunter. We'd follow John's Brook for about four and a half miles, deep into the interior of the eastern high peaks. This would be our base camp for the next two nights. The next morning, we cross over John's Brook and begin our hike up the coal toward Upper and Lower Wolf Jaw. Here we'll turn right and begin our climb up Upper Wolf Jaw. The first high peak of the day and our first look at what we have in front of us. Then we'll give back some elevation only to gain it again and arrive on top of Armstrong, our second high peak on this traverse. Now we'll traverse the ridge over to what should not only be the best views of the day, but also the most challenging part of this hike, Gothic's Mountain. I say the most challenging because before we can return to camp, we have to deal with this. The Gothic's Cable Route, which is exactly what it looks like. Now, most people climb up this, but because I wanted to end on Gothic's, we're going to be climbing down it, which I have never attempted before. And the fun won't stop there, because even once you're done with this, you still have some pretty tricky slides and a bunch of ladders to negotiate before you can drop down into the valley floor and then cruise on back to camp, where we can reflect on the epic views we had today, but also get a really good night's sleep, because day three is not going to be any easier. After a good breakfast and some great coffee, we'll break down camp and start our journey. This time we'll be pouring on the elevation heading the opposite direction on our way up to Big Slide, our fourth high peak of the trip. After soaking in the views of this granite faced behemoth, we'll drop into yet another valley before climbing again to start our trek across the Three Brothers. A triple peak traverse, up one, down the other, with many views in between until finally, you guessed it, back at the garden park. Sounds pretty epic, right? It's not exactly what happened. So usually for the last hour of the drive, you get to watch the mountains come into view and get closer until you're in them. That was replaced with giant dark clouds with heavy white clouds filling the valleys below the peaks. Once we arrived in Keene, we were underneath those clouds and it was raining. Now, the forecast was for three days of nearly 0% chance of rain. So we thought this was a fluke. And we decided to go to Newmark Diner. And we even had a window seat where we could normally look at the mountains that we'd be hiking in soon. But instead, we just got to see the clouds. So with our bellies full, we headed out the door and went to the garden parking lot. We sat there for about an hour watching it rain. Now, the temperatures were gonna be hovering around high 30s, 40 degrees. It's not the best thing, especially that deep in, to start off with a hike in that kind of weather. I just didn't think it was a good idea. So, I said, hey, I know of a spot. I was gonna take Logan here someday. It's only about a little under a two mile hike to the campsite. It's right on a lake and we'll start over tomorrow. So we drove to Moose Mountain Pond, hoping we'd escape this rain. After all, it wasn't supposed to rain. This was probably just a small little cell that was moving over. Well, the weather was no different there. But we hiked out to the campsite, stayed at the campsite for about an hour, sitting on a log, watching the rain increasingly get heavier and heavier as it moved across the lake. And I decided to call it. We hiked back to the truck 
I got on my phone and I booked us a room at the Devlin in Lake Placid. We'll just have a nice warm dry night, come up with a different plan for tomorrow, and we'll hit it. So that's what we did. The next morning signaled a new day, a new parking lot, and a new plan. And this time, the sun is out, and it feels great. Today, we're gonna start from the Adirondack Lodge. We're gonna start heading down toward Marcy Dam, but then we're gonna take a right onto the Algonquin and Wright Peak Trail. We're gonna head up that for a ways, and there should be a campsite just before you hit the no camping zone. After we set up camp, we climb the rest of the way up the mountain to the top of Algonquin the second highest peak in New York. Then we climb down the other side of Algonquin, across Boundary Peak and up Iroquois. After some lunch and some well-deserved rest, we retrace our steps, climb back up Algonquin, down the other side, and then take a right, no pun intended, and climb right peak. Tragically, in 1962, a B-47 bomber crashed into the top of this mountain. Evidence of that wreckage is still found at the peak today. We then retrace our steps back down to our campsite, spend the night, and have relative ease the next morning with only a couple miles and downhill hiking all the way back. Sounds like a good plan B, right? Logan got kicked out of that sign last time. It's your duty. nice weather, but also the relative ease of the Van Hovenberg Trail. And in no time at all, we've already found ourselves at the right-hand turn where we would start heading up to Algonquin. At first, there's only a slight increase in the difficulty of this trail. So, as we cruised along, John would snap pictures of various subjects, and I remember thinking how thankful I was to finally be out here after the previous day's setbacks. After about another three quarters of a mile, the trail starts to get a little steeper and a little rockier. Still very manageable, especially compared to what we're going to be facing pretty much immediately after we set up camp. Trail for skiing. Okay. This is trail for skiing only. I will say that the transition is not gradual. And I am at this point looking forward to getting this pack off my back once we get to camp. Yeah, I see what you're saying about it. It's just big granite faces. Yeah. But I don't have to wait, because according to my GPS, we've made it to the point where we get to empty our packs before we continue any further. And there's also a fresh water source nearby, so we can fill up, rehydrate, continue on with the day. So that must mean that we finally made it to our... Oh no. Very full campsite. You've got to be kidding. No camping beyond this point. Mm. 
so I rolled the dice here, and I lost. It's a Wednesday, late in September, and I would have bet a hundred times that this campsite would be open. Our only other option is about four miles away, after summoning the peaks. So this isn't the type of area that you would just backpack through. I mean, people do it, yes, but normally you'd set up a base camp and go hit the high peaks and come back and camp at your base camp. You can ask a through hiker when they start out on, say, the AT. You gradually build up your mileage over the first week just to kind of get your legs. I did not feel like climbing over these peaks with a full pack and then doing a pretty sketchy drop, very steep, down into the valley where we would be able to camp at Lake Colton. At this point, I'm kind of mentally spent, so we turned around. Sounds pretty dumb, I know. Okay, so stick with me here. I promise from this point forward, we do actually accomplish everything we set out to do. But I have only 24 hours left to camp in the woods and get a hike again. Sick of it. <laughs> So I need to come up with a plan, and I need to come up with it quickly. So first things first, we need a place to stay tonight, and I think I know just the spot. We're already in Lake Placer, so if we drive northwest through Saranac, out to Paul Smith's, we can hit up a spot that I took Logan to his first time up here, Jones Pond. In all fairness, this wasn't a bad trade-off. I had forgotten how nice the spots at Jones Pond were. So this isn't the exact same spot that Logan and I stayed in. That's down the road a little further, and that one was already occupied. Which leads me to my next story. But John took a bunch of pictures here, so I think I have time to tell it. So we just started unpacking and started setting everything up and this brand new big jacked up pickup truck drives by and I said, oh, that must be our neighbors. When we went to the other campsite, we saw a tent there, but no vehicle. So we figured this must be them. So we continue unpacking and a few minutes later, this guy walks up and says, hey, I'm stuck in the mud down here. Can you help me out? By this time, we have stuff strewn about everywhere, out of every door in the truck, on the tailgate. Of course I'm gonna help them out, but I just said, sure, but you're gonna have to give us a few minutes. So John, probably sensing my frustration, and knowing that we just drove through the same exact mud, said, hey, did you try using four-wheel drive? To which he said, no, I hadn't thought of that. I kind of just chuckled under my breath. So John said to him, why don't you try that, and if it doesn't work, we'll come get you out. To which the guy said, okay, thanks, I'll let you know how I make out. So we continue setting up, and a few minutes later we see that truck drive by. So we both gave him a wave, and he waved back, and John and I had a bit of a chuckle between us, and we thought, well, he did say he just got the truck, maybe he just didn't know. Some hours had gone by, we've already eaten dinner and had a fire going, and we were just about getting ready to go to bed, when all of a sudden in the shadows, I see a figure walking down the trail. It was the same guy from the truck, only this time, he was walking back to his camp, and he had an axe with him, kind of swinging around like a baton. Now the optimist in me said, well, he just didn't want to drive the truck back through the mud and get stuck again and he's carrying the axe back to his campsite so that he can chop wood. But there was still something a little unnerving about it. So right before we went to bed, I handed John my knife, the one he had used to chop wood with earlier, and said, look man, you're a lot younger and in a lot better shape than I am. If you hear me scream in the middle of the night, do what you gotta do. We both kind of half-heartedly laughed, but we also knew that there was truth in that statement. 
Fortunately, we made it through the night without incident and awoke to a beautiful morning on Jones Pond. Still as the water with the fog just hovering above it. It was really, really nice. We took our time packing up, had breakfast, one coffee turned into three, and finally headed out. But not before soaking in every last drop of this peaceful environment. After all, my plan for today was pretty much foolproof. Although, I wasn't going to tempt fate and say that out loud. On our way to the trailhead, we stopped in Saranac. They have a beautiful little park at the boat launch and restrooms with running water. So we took the opportunity to clean ourselves up a little bit and then just soak in the sights of this idyllic little mountain town. John snapped a bunch of photos. We had a few snacks and filled up our water bottles. This is always one of my stopping points when I'm on this side of the park. Our next stop is about 20 miles down the road at a trailhead that will hopefully lead us to our first 46 high peak of this trip, Cascade Mountain. We're on day three of our Adirondack adventure, and today we might actually make it to the top of one of these mountains. Just hoping. <laughs> to finally a high peak. We're gonna get there. <laughs> so this final attempt is going to be Cascade Mountain. Probably the most accessible of all the high peaks. You basically pull over on the side of the road and just start climbing. Unfortunately, this trail sees a high amount of traffic. But once we get to the top, you'll see why. We're about halfway up Cascade. So far, we haven't had to turn around. We'll see if our luck holds. <laughs> Going up. So normally, to reach one of the top of these high peaks is going to require a minimum of a 10 mile journey. And this trail, coming in at half that, has suffered from high traffic with major erosion. And that's why they'll be closing it down, I believe starting next year. But they've been building a new trail, which is twice as long, coming from the other direction over Porter. And normally you would go over to Porter from Cascade since you're already up here. However, with the amount of muddy dogs and people that we passed that said they just came from Porter, 
Johnny and I decided to kind of skip that one. We'll take the new trail next time. There she be. Final approach on Cascade. So as you can see, you're highly rewarded for your efforts. And amongst those giants, Zhang and I get to look at the path that we would have done on day one. Find that summit marker and make it official. <laughs> Lunch action on Cascade Mountain.
Oh, oh. Nice recovery. <laughs> so without actually saying it, I think we were both thinking, let's see how fast we can get down this trail. And we both probably pushed it right to the line a couple times. I know that my trekking pole saved me on more than one occasion. It may not look like it, but we are actually keeping a pretty fast pace. After all, this isn't exactly a trail that you would use for trail running. And I'm pretty sure we made it to the bottom in under an hour, which is pretty respectable. <sighs> Done. Cash game out. Yeah, man. That was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. Got down there quick. Three days, chaos, I mean adventure. Was adventure. It's about the journey. <laughs> it's about the journey no matter the plan. We're finally one high peak. We got it. We got it done. <laughs> it was awesome. It was awesome. So as we started our drive back to Keene Valley, I realized we only had one more turn to make before we find ourselves on the interstate, heading out of the park and on our way home. And I just wasn't ready to leave yet. So I decided we'd make one last stop. more little leg structure before the ride home. So not only did I want to salvage as much as I possibly could out of this trip, but I've also found a little trick. After about a half hour of driving, stop, get out, and walk around. It helps ward off the cramping that happens to occur on a long drive home. And Roaring Book Crawls fit that time slot perfectly. At a little over a half mile over very easy terrain to the base of the falls, Roaring Brook never disappoints. I can't help but feel like I have some unfinished business here. So my hope is, next season, I'll get John back up here, we'll get into that great range for three days, and we'll hike that traverse. And we'll finally be able to check those peaks off the list. <laughs>